for our next session. Uh, we're going to hear from Barry Lynn, who's a director of the Markets, Enterprise, and Resiliency Initiative. So he owns the R Word here at New America, um, the initiative here at New America. He's the author of End of the Line, The Rise and Coming Fall of the Global Corporation. Then we're going to hear a presentation from Rob McNish, who's a principal of corporate finance and strategy practice at McKinsey and Company. Uh, they're going to have two diff very different talks and then followed by a short conversation with Matt Iglesias, who is the business and economics correspondent at Slate Magazine and the author of the recently pu published The Rent is Too Damn High. Uh, we have uh, put on, on this segment the... Uh, the, the title for this is Resilient Capitalism, How to Thrive in the Face of Disruptive Change, and that will encompass both presentations and the conversation. And uh, I, should just, I should just note that this was something that, that we did um, in kind of editing today's program, so it's not the title for each talk, and I think uh, Barry and Rob might be quick to point that out, and so uh, their conversations will take us in different directions, and I now present to you Barry Lynn. Thanks, Andres, and uh, thanks for all you to co uh, coming out today. And um, this is a, uh, I've been working on resiliency for about 10, 12 years, and it's somewhat of a different take than some of the earlier things you've heard today, because it's kind of looking at resiliency in terms of systems, in terms of engineered systems. And sort of to get a sense about actually what, um, uh, talking about, I think it helps to sort of start out by looking at uh, a couple of engineered uh, sort of, uh, systems, which are ships. And um, now the first ship is a, a ship that was uh, launched in about 1858, and it's a ship that was called the Great Eastern. And this at the time was the most advanced ship any place in the world. Uh, it was, uh, had a, and it was also, it was told, it was said to be unsinkable. It was built with a double hull. It had uh, a stem to stern bulkhead deck. It had three modes of, 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 of propulsion. And um, it uh, turned out to be actually unsinkable. In about 1862, that ship hit a rock off of Montauk Point. That, even to today, that rock is called Mon uh, the, the Great Eastern Rock. And that rock ripped a hole 90 feet long and about 10 feet wide in, in, the, in the hull of that ship. And that ship stayed afloat. They got it into port. They fixed it, and it spent another 30 years going back and forth across the Atlantic laying cable. The other ship you may recognize was launched about 50 years later. That's called the Titanic. Now, you know that they left a few things out of that ship, uh, such as you know there weren't quite enough uh, lifeboats on that ship. They also left out the double hull, and they also left out the, the bulkhead deck. You know, the thing about when, when, when Ballard's crew got down to the bottom of the ocean back in the 1990s and they looked at the, the, the hull of this ship, one of the things they found out is that unlike what people thought they were going to find, there was really no gash. It was just kind of an area on the, on the front part of the ship where the plates had been buckled. Um, the actual amount of the hull was about 1 20th of the total space of the, the hull that had been ripped in the, in the uh, Great Eastern Hull. The uh, water had come in, not in a, a huge rush, but it kept coming in. And the problem was that the first ship had 14 different compartments. Titanic also had compartments. But the top ship had a bulkhead deck. That means every single compartment was enclosed. The bottom ship, the Titanic, it had gotten rid of that bulkhead deck. So when that water is come seeping in through the front of the ship, when it got to the top of the compartment, it spilled into the next compartment. And then it spilled into the next compartment. And all of a sudden, that ship just went straight down to the bottom. The, uh, so the lesson is that in the first ship, in the Great Eastern, a disaster in one place, it was built so you could keep that disaster in that one place. You could localize that disaster. That ship was a resilient system. Second ship, disaster in one place, because there was no ability to localize that disaster, it becomes a disaster every place. That is not a resilient system. So anyway, I mean, really, uh, you know, human beings are actually pretty good at building resilient systems. You know, we do it with, 
And you know, a resilient system is something that you know you, you it's when there's a shock, you're able to dampen that shock, you're able to distribute the shock, you're able to compartmentalize the shock, you're able to localize the disaster. You know, we we did it with we with electrical systems. We have circuit breakers. We do it with large uh, jets. We have multiple engines on those jets. So if something goes wrong, you got another engine. Um, we do it with flood control. Not so well in, in, in perhaps in New Orleans, but pretty well most ev everywhere else. We do it with uh, um, the internet. That's actually, this is a, a picture of resilient systems. This is Paul Barron's uh, uh, sort of draft of a, 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 of a picture of what the internet might look like. This is from 1960. So we're pretty good at figuring out how not to put all our eggs in one basket, but not always. So just to sort of figure, uh, see uh, uh, how it sometimes we don't do a very good job of distributing risk, I'm going to tell a story about what happened after an earthquake in Taiwan in 1999, in, in September 21 of that year. The, it was actually a pretty big quake. It was about 7.6 magnitude, killed about 2,500 people. But um, what, you know, that was on the other side of the world. What was interesting is what happened after that, which is just a few days later, in the United States, all these factories suddenly shut down. As it turned out, the reason that all these factories in the United States suddenly shut down is because that part of Taiwan, there was actually a, a, a town about an hour outside of, of, of Taipei called Sinju. And in this town of Sinju, it turned out that almost all of a certain kind of semiconductor came out of that one town. And they'd stick it on airplanes, they'd fly it across the ocean, and then uh, put it into all those uh, into, uh, uh, computers and other products and all those uh, factories all around the United States. So what happened, luckily, that town was not affected by the earthquake. What happened, the earthquake knocked out power to the airport, couldn't fly the ships in and out, so within a few days, the system uh, went down. The, um, sort of to understand what this meant, though, what this was, uh, what we had is a, a single point of failure. So that when you lose that, when there's a failure at that one point, you lose the whole system. So the system that, in which products are moving around, in which component A is connecting to component B, to component C, to component D, and then at the end of the day, all of these nations have the product. Suddenly you get to, get to a point where it doesn't happen. You, no one has the product. And, uh, but anyways, like what we saw back in 1999, that was the world's first industrial crash. So, and unfortunately, it was not the last crash. We saw sort of uh, uh, seizures of industrial systems. After September 11, we were paying a lot of attention to something else at the time. But what, what also happened during that, just in the days right afterwards, is that a number of industrial systems essentially ground to a halt. Uh, we saw it uh, during the SARS epidemic in uh, 2003. There were major disruptions in, in supply systems. There were... Um, in 2002, the uh, Indians and the Pakistanis were threatening to throw nuclear weapons back and forth at each other. One of the things that companies like GE and Citibank realize is that all of that capacity for processing information that they've stuck down in South uh, India, if there's any kind of event that would take these two nations offline, they don't get to import that information anymore in real time. And that means that companies like GE and Citibank might go black for at least a period of time. The most dramatic industrial crash happened last year. This was after the, what the Japanese called the triple disaster, which was the earthquake and the tsunami and then the Fukushima uh, uh, sort of nuclear disaster. Now, the, it's important to understand sort of the magnitude of the disruption of, from this, this industrial crash. You know, in, in, you know in, in Japan, most of the industry in the country is located in the south, in, in places around Osaka and, and then further to the, uh, to the west. Up in the north where this happened, there was very, very, very little industry. Uh, yet, uh, what we saw is truly phenomenal. This is a drop off in the uh, amount of activity, industrial activity, pr uh, production activity. In, uh, in the period right after the, the quake. Now this compares, there was a very 
to understand how the world is changing, in 1995, there was a very devastating quake right in Kobe, in the heart of their industrial uh, uh, area. And what we ended up with at that point was a relatively minor, at the time it seemed big, but it was about a little, you know, 3% drop. And here we have a quake way to the north, way outside the, the, the zone of, 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 of central production, and you have a truly massive uh, uh, blow to the system. The, you know, just to, and I just want to emphasize, it's not only, you know, sort of these hard industrial systems, electronics. Uh, what we see is, uh, um, well, actually, just going, you know, just so we understand, the, the Japanese quake, um, the other thing that we saw from that is that it was a synchronized event in multiple countries. We saw that, you know, what we just saw here, that's a drop off in, in activity in Japan. At the same time that that happened, we saw really significant drops in activity in pretty much every industrialized country in the world, in North America, in Europe. Uh, and this is actually a quote from a Reuters uh, 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 article at that time, and what they said is we've seen a remarkably synchronized worldwide economic slowdown due to this event. And then at the same time, it's like, here's an event, again, it's on the other side of the world, and here in the United States, the result was, and this is another quote, this is about three months after the event, uh, this was from a, 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 an article that came out in early June of last year, the Philadelphia Fed sees the largest three-month drop ever in production activity. This is because of an event on the other side of the world. So it's not only heavy industrial, uh, uh, it's not only electronics, um, but one of the things we've seen is that, say, uh, vitamin C, which is also called ascorbic acid. There's the number of, of, of products, of components that where, you know, like that chip that was in, in Taipei, in Taiwan, in, in Sinju, uh, the number of components where we see massive concentration of production of capacity in one place, uh, every day seems to, the list grows longer every day. Uh, uh, vitamin C, which is also called ascorbic acid, it's something that we put into pretty much every packaged food in the United States. Uh, we use it to preserve the foods. The, uh, uh, vitamin C was a, uh, the, the molecule was first identified by an American scientist. It was first synthesized by an American scientist. It was first mass produced by an American company. Today, 100% of the vitamin C that we use in this country comes out of China. If any break in, in supply, we don't have this thing that we use in all of our uh, 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 packaged food systems. Uh, drugs, the chemicals that go into our drug systems, I mean, the drugs are often manufactured here, but the actual chemicals, 90% of those chemicals come out of China. DRAMs, 70% uh, of the DRAM factory, you think people might have learned something from the Taiwan quake in, two, in, in 1999. Today, about 70% of all the DRAM production is located uh, in and around, actually, usually, essentially in one place outside of Seoul, about 30 miles from the DMZ. Uh, what could this mean? It would mean if a large disruption, potentially catastrophic disruption, it would mean potentially huge hit in, in the number of jobs that we have here. But it could also mean, obviously, disruptions in our drug supply systems, disruptions in our food supply systems. This uh, medical mask, the, uh, after the SARS scare of, uh, of 2003, I have a friend out in... in uh, uh, Minnesota named Michael Osterholm. He's an epidemiologist. Uh, Minnesota is also the place where you have 3M. So uh, he went, Michael uh, uh, realized that there was something here, even though he's an epidemiologist, he realized that the disruptions of these systems could be actually a bigger problem than the sickness itself. And to prove this to himself, he went and he knocked on the door of 3M and he said, well, how do you make these masks that we rely on? And uh, what they said is, well, you know, this is actually a beautiful thing. In the old days, we used to have this big pile of raw material, and then we had a, a factory in which you had these machines in series, and then at the end, we had a big warehouse with all the stuff ready to go, months of supplies sitting in one place. And now what we've done is we have transformed the system. It's all lean. It's all just in time. We bring the components in from Asia. 
We put them together lickety split. We we ship them out immediately. There's no waste any place in the system. And then Michael asked these guys, he goes, well, what if there were any break in the supply of goods coming from Asia, say, because of SARS, because people are not allowing these planes to fly back and forth? And these people who actually make these masks said, you know, we actually have never thought about that. No. You know, it's, it's not only industrial systems, big and small, it's also uh, banking. You know, you've heard about too big to fail, too integrated to fail. You know, it's essentially the same flaw in principle that we see in, in the banking system. With, with the, we also see it in monetary systems. The European monetary system, uh, right now we're dealing with this, uh, a, a situation in which the adoption of the euro by multiple countries has eliminated all the flexibility, all the resiliency that used to exist in that system for people to adjust to meet different cha uh, changes in the, uh, uh, in, in econo in the economic performance. So why are some systems less resilient than others? You know, is it something to do with the nature of the system? Is it perhaps something to do with, you know, something that's inherent in the character of capitalism? Or is it something else? You know, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to jump ahead to, uh, right straight to two answers, and then I'm going to explain why these two answers fit. And the first answer is monopolization. And this I would define as when people use the business corporation to capture control over some activity, some production activity in this case. And then they often, in the process of capturing control of, over that activity, they will concentrate actual capacity in one or a couple places. The um, other answer is mercantilism. And mercantilism is essentially when people use the corporation that we call the nation state to do the same thing as people use the private business corporation to do, which is to capture control, exercise power in ways that allow you to capture control over some activity, and often to concentrate that capacity. So the reason, so you end up with all, uh, all of one thing in Sinju and Taipei, all the DRAMs near uh, 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 Seoul. So, um, you know, just uh, now as, uh, to explain exactly how this happens, I'm just going to really very briefly look at uh, sort of the, the nature of the industrial system, the st old structure of the industrial system. This here is like sort of a, a depicts how the automotive system looked around 1990. It was vertically integrated. Each corporation pretty much did everything underneath it. Every corporation had its own man, uh, windshield wiper manufacturer, its own manufacturer of, of alternators, et cetera, et cetera. By, say, about 2005, uh, outsourcing, every one of these companies had broken apart from their supply base. And in the process of breaking it apart from the supply base, they basically left their supply base open to those who would concentrate control over certain activities. So now, in some cases, we have uh, two companies that dominate the worldwide production of windshield wipers. We have two companies that dominate the worldwide production of piston rings, as opposed to having five, as I saw there, and actually maybe more like 20 in reality. Um, industrial, uh, this is um, sort of a picture of industrial nations circa 1990. Industrial nations circa 1990 were vertically, in, you had these were vertically integrated. Those were uh, uh, systems to make cars. Uh, most, there was not a lot of movement of product, of components from the United States to Japan or to, to Germany. Um, and then what we have now is this. And what you, uh, the difference between 2000, I mean, 19, uh, uh, 1990 and, and um, 2005 is uh, we ha saw uh, what was called offshoring which is the breaking apart of the vertically integrated nation state. So, and that of course leads to a, sy a system that functions like that. So anyway, to end up, the, um, some systems are less resilient than others because they are poorly engineered. 
or actually in, more accurately in the case of, of these systems that I'm describing, they were really never engineered as systems, even though they are systems. Now, the reason that we have this bad engineering, this bad engineering is essentially a function of bad politics, bad political decisions. And I'll just, you know, there's a lot of bad political decisions we've made in this country and around the world last 30 years. I'll just name two that are directly pertinent to the systems that we're looking at. 1981, we essentially got rid of antitrust in this country. For 200 years, we had antitrust, for better or worse, and a, and a monopoly law. 30 years ago, we got rid of it. No one has looked at how that affects the functioning of these systems. Other change, 1994. The, uh, the sort of the approval of the general agreement, the Uruguay round of the general agreement on tariffs and trade, which led to the WTO. That took 200 years of experience in terms of using your border to distribute your reliance in other countries and threw it out the door. It opened the door to radical concentration of power over certain activities by the Chinese, also by the Koreans, also by the Taiwanese, increasingly by the Germans. Those two political decisions, probably more than any others, allowed for a few people to essentially put all our eggs in one basket or to create these single points of failure. The result, you know, is essentially we, have, we now are dependent upon a, an industrial system that is not resilient. It is brittle and it becomes more brittle every day. It is built to break. And just so we know what we missed in terms of our opportunity, back in the 1990s when we began to offshore, when we began to outsource, we could have exercised power, mind, upon those processes in ways that would have led to a far, far more distributed system a far more resilient system, where a shock anywhere, we could have isolated it and localized it. Instead, we now have a system that is built to transmit shock instantly, and even to amplify that shock. So this, you know, um, I gotta uh, move on here, but uh, solutions, uh, don't have time for the solutions. You'll have to come back for that. <laughs> yeah, but, um, um, uh, yeah, there are solutions, you know, and actually the, the good news is that they're actually relatively simple, and, but they're entirely political in nature. Anyway, thank you. All right. Uh, my name is Rob McNish. I'm a partner with McKinsey & Company based in Washington, D.C., and based on the uh, other topics here today, I would call myself the knuckle-dragging, mouth-breathing capitalist in the crowd. Uh, and I'd like to talk to you uh, from our experience in how corporations are or are not resilient in the face of what we would call disruptive change, not the normal everyday pace of change, but things that really require a corporation to respond uh, dramatically if it's, if it's to be successful. Uh, I guess I've got the control here. So first, uh, not to belabor the point, but um, many people believe that a number of uh, global forces have increased or accelerated the pace of uh, change or the number of events of dramatic change that impact corporations, among them globalization, some of the things that Barry talked about, uh, technology and innovation, uh, liberalization, uh, which he all talked about, higher velocity, faster cycle times, and a profound distribution of fortune between winners and losers, winner takes all. Uh, and concentration, uh, as he mentioned, and therefore uh, brittleness in the, uh, in the system. A chart I don't have, but would have been a nice um, complement to Barry's discussion, uh, is one that we, other people, I think, call the great moderation and sort of the reversal of that. A period of about 20, 25 years from roughly the end of the 80s until the early 2000s, when we, as a, as an, as a global economy, experienced uh, inherently lower volatility. Uh, you almost look at anything, volatility in commodity prices, volatility in distributions of market shares, volatility in stock price uh, movements. Um, they all moderated uh, during that period. 
And many of the trends that, that Barry was talking about were uh, exploited um, and, and pursued during that uh, great moderation. Um, we made supply chains more brittle. Uh, we made um, uh, business models more brittle, uh, largely in, in economic response to a lower cost of risk from this great moderation of risk. Risk is now back. Uh, if you look at the, at the charts, um, the great moderation has reversed itself to more normal um, historical periods, and those decisions are looking less wise. Now, when those decisions were being made, many were made unconsideredly. Others that were made on a considered basis were made in the context of lower volatility, and they made sense at the time. I'll pursue slightly lower average costs uh, in my supply chain and, and supply network because the risk of failure uh, is, uh, is smaller or less expensive. Now that the risk of failure is larger and more expensive, those decisions look poor, and that's why you see people talking about bringing things back home right, uh, to manufacture here, and why you see in our supply chain practice more and more people requalifying second and third and fourth suppliers, whereas before they had concentrated their supply on one person. So people are reversing these decisions slowly uh, and painfully over time. I'm going to take it up uh, a level, though, and talk about um, overall corporate uh, resiliency. Uh, and this chart represents uh, a ver fairly simple analysis of uh, how resilient or how sustainable leaders are in their industry uh, over time. And the chart depicts the, uh, the percentage probability that a company in the top fifth of its industry in one, in one year, five years later, has uh, lost that position of, of being in the top fifth. And in 1975, uh, if you were in the top fifth of, of revenues in your industry in 1975, you had roughly a, a, an 8% chance five years later of not being in the top fifth. Relatively modest uh, turnover in the top quintile of, of companies in any given industry. Uh, more recently, 90, if you were in, in the top quintile in 1997 at the right-hand side of this chart, you had more like a 30 or 32% chance of not being in the top quintile five years later. So this is, there's many ways of, of describing the same phenomenon, but the turnover rate, the churn rate of successful companies um, has dramatically accelerated over the last 30 years or so. You see this in members of the S&P 500, uh, members of the Dow 30, well not the Dow 30, that's pretty stable. But you see a lot, of, a lot more change. Why are few successful companies able to navigate what we would call disruptive change? Most of these answers are pretty straightforward. Right? They respond late, either because they don't see it or they're calcified and can't react to it. Uh, it's tough. <laughs> it's hard to know what to do. If you see it and want to respond, sometimes it's hard to figure out what to do. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty in making the change and a lot of internal conflict in organizations. Often we find companies making incremental responses, the frog in boiling water problem. Oh, the, I think this water might just be a little warmer, let me respond a little bit, but actually no, it's, it's going to boil and you better move quickly. And sometimes you just made bad choices, right? You, you don't know, um, you choose to move in a certain direction and it was wrong. Let me move toward the realm of answers. When we synthesize our research around navigating disruptive change uh, successfully, it tends to, the answers tend to fall into three categories for us from a, ma from a manager's point of view. Uh, the first I'll call refocusing the portfolio. And the message here is that strategic insight matters and strategic bold leadership matters. Uh, seeing what's happening, figuring out what's going on, figuring out what the possible responses are to it, and then acting boldly uh, is a big key to uh, adapting and, and being resilient as an organization. So this is you know, the value of the, of the team at the top, of reaching strategic insight and making a big move, and being bold in its refocusing of, of resources, which in a corporate environment is very difficult to do, because reallocating resources means calling winners and losers, and that means resisting an organization that doesn't want to be on the losing end of the resource reallocation. Second uh, uh, effective response comes from what we would call transforming the core. Uh, this is about fundamentally changing the business model and the way things uh, operate today in your core businesses. And here are the key messages around organizational structure and organizational uh, complexity and organizational resilience. And I'll give you an example of that shortly. The third uh, uh, factor in, in success is what we call building new businesses. Well, in response to change, things are going to die. And if you just let it happen to you and pieces of your business die and you don't replace it with new things, then the organization slowly dies and you end up in a downward spiral. So an organization's ability to 
uh, accelerate its pace of growth and innovation and newness is a really big part of responding to disruptive change. It's sort of realizing that some things are going to go away and I need to replace them. And as an overall entity, if you don't replace the things faster than the things that are going away, you die. And here I'll talk about the importance of culture, people, and incentives. And let me do some of this by talking about a case example of Unilever and Procter and & Gamble. So let's bring it right down to selling soap uh, and, and talk a bit about, I'll focus my remarks mostly on Procter & Gamble because I hate talking about companies uh, negatively. Uh, and Procter and & Gamble is the positive part of this, uh, of this battle. Let's talk about the late 1990s, a number of things that were hitting the uh, consumer goods sector, particularly in the product categories represented by P&G and Unilever. Uh, there were a proliferation of brands trying to share the same, uh, the same pie. Uh, consumer goods companies noticed that brands mattered, that differentiating brands allowed them to price uh, differentiate, and therefore they proliferated brands, but it, it, it led to a tremendous amount of complexity and cost and potential confusion in the system. Most importantly, the second chevron here, channel power was consolidating. Uh, uh, retails, retail was consolidating, the rise of Walmart was creating a player in the supply chain that had dramatic power over players like P&G and Unilever. These companies were traditionally used to using retailers as rented space, is sort of the business model. It, the, the, the hierarchy uh, of power changed and Walmart became, began using P&G and Unilever as suppliers. Uh, so the balance of power in the system fundamentally changed through consolidation and the success of the Walmart business model. We had evolving consumer needs. I won't belabor some of these uh, shift away from traditional media, right? The internet, moving away from uh, normal modes of advertising, broadcast television and print. Uh, and then we had obviously uh, some investor um, concerns or considerations around who was getting capital and who wasn't getting capital. While the dot-com boom was going, companies like these were not getting capital and then when it bust, uh, no one was getting capital. In response to these changes, Unilever and P&G both launched growth programs. Right? They saw it. Uh, they were, their, their bottom or the top line was coming down. Sales were actually falling for the first time in a long, long time. And their stock price was getting hit dramatically. It got the attention of the executive teams and both of them said, ah, we need, in response to this, we need to change and we need to grow. Both uh, developed uh, fairly sophisticated growth programs uh, and then launched them uh, in 2000, 2001. Uh, and regardless, so Unilever called theirs the path to growth, uh, and P&G uh, called it their Organization 2005 campaign. They were fundamentally different in nature. Um, the Unilever approach uh, was biased toward uh, improving the profitability of the current business, and the P&G approach was wired more in the in the in the vein of creating new capabilities and making the organization more flexible, more complex, but but more flexible. Both were directed at trying to regrow the organization, but their approaches were, were quite different. I'll dig into P and G a little bit. So this is a P and G chart. I didn't put the logo up. I forgot. Um, back to that refocusing the portfolio. What this chart represents is the mix of revenue in the P&G portfolio by division or by product line from food all the way down to healthcare and it, how that evolved between 1999 and 2005. Now, if you draw this chart for 100 random companies in the S&P 500, you usually find it to be a lot more static than this. This doesn't look like a lot of change, but in a corporation as large as P&G, this is a, dr a dramatic amount of change in terms of what parts of their portfolio are, are, uh, are growing and which parts are shrinking. This represents a very bold, top-down executive initiative to say, we're gonna double down in beauty care and health care. And we're going to de-emphasize food and baby and family and fabric and home care. Those are very difficult decisions for corporations to make, and this is very bold. This was top-down leadership, and it was A.G. Laffley. Uh, A.G. Laffley was uh, named chairman right around this time. In fact, it was his plan went before he was uh, CEO and chairman that was put into effect uh, as, as CEO and chairman. In fact, his, his plan got him the job. Uh, and his approach to doing business was appropriate for this time. He's a bold strategic decision maker. And he said, we need to make clearer the tough strategic choices and act on them, focus on uh, leading brands and focus on leading products and focus on leading countries. So he, he said, we're doing an awful lot of stuff. 
we need to focus on where we're winning. And that was uh, a difficult strategic choice to make because it created a lot of losers in his organization, people who didn't get the resources. Shifted mix, focused on big countries. Let me talk a bit about organization. Now this, is, I don't expect you to care about this chart, but what, what it means is on, on the left-hand side, you see um, a bad representation of a classic matrix organization structure. It, p and had a matrix organization structure, and if you've ever lived inside of one, they're enormously frustrating. They are expensive, they are slow sometimes, they are wasteful, um, accountabilities are overlapping, right? But in the face of dramatic change, it worked. Uh, the organization structure here has um, regions to it, it's got product lines to it, and it's got functions to it. Think of a three-dimensional cube with those three dimensions as, as, the, uh, as the organization structure. Unilever uh, had a classic, largely single dimension um, uh, organization structure with regional uh, operating units and then sub-regional operating units within it. And then product lines were, were embedded within that. But in the P&G structure, product lines, geographies, and functions were all at the same level of the organization battling in a matrix. And in, in Unilever, it was a lot more uh, lockstep uh, uh, hierarchy of, of region down to subregion, then down to product. Um, the P&G model proved much more resilient uh, in, the, in, in this time period because there was a lot of uncertainty and it f the, the, or the matrix model forces cross-functional collaboration, cross-regional collaboration, and a lot of discussion among managers before they decide what to do. And that led to better problem solving and better direction setting. The result was pretty clear. Over the subsequent five years after both those programs were launched, P&G grew at 6%, Unilever shrank, and TRS is the total return to shareholders. This is if you had invested a dollar, what would it be worth? Uh, in P&G, you would have experienced a 6.2% per annum uh, return. In Unilever, you would have lost 4.3% a year over this five-year period. So the results were pretty stark in, in the different approaches. Now, the good news for Unilever is, is that it's an intelligent, uh, capable organization, and they realized uh, within about four or five years that they needed to rechange uh, the approach. And they adopted, a, in 2005, an approach that wasn't exactly like P&G's, but it had some of the, some of the same elements. Uh, a lot more uh, uh, focus, uh, calling of winners and losers, shifting of resources, and major changes to the organization that increased the complexity of the organization, but, but made it more adaptive and more resilient. And those are my charts. Well, sir, so, uh, thank you for, for two great uh, great presentations. Um, you know, I thought I would I would kick this off uh, just just by asking Barry. Uh, what, what seemed like the obvious question to me watching watching that presentation is that you know we can we can see clearly that there there are some problems here that there are some downsides to concentrating your supply chain. Um, but why is it that? we shouldn't just assume that, that companies, corporate leaders, will be able to look at this, see, well, you know, what's the cost involved in diversifying my supply chain, but what's the benefit, and kind of make the shift in response to these kind of events you're talking about. Um, you, you know, I, what, is the, what is the political problem here, as opposed to simply a, a corporate strategy problem for, for business leaders to think through on their own terms? Uh, <clears throat> that's a great question, and uh, it's one I've been dealing with for 15, 12 years now, and uh, the uh, I mean, there's a because what we have here is essentially a, a, a million rational decisions, or, you know, a, a million people going out and doing exactly the right thing according to uh, the environment of law in which they find themselves, 
And then it all adds up to a system that if you step back and look at it from the point of view of society as a whole, is, uh, is, is grotesquely uh, um, is, is, uh, uh, engineered. And um, so the, the, you do have a number of people who do make wise decisions. You have some companies that are, you know, as, as Rob was saying, are, are making this effort to uh, uh, you know, find uh, the second, find the third, find the fourth uh, supplier, uh, to force those suppliers to distribute their, their production. Uh, but there's, there's actually two problems with this. A lot of, uh, most, one, most of these, a number of these efforts tend to run out of steam after a short period of time. And I spent uh, the summer of 2008 in Japan and I was looking at the effects of an earthquake that had taken place the previous summer in a town called Niigata, when, when, uh, in which a single piston ring company got knocked out. So I spent a lot of time talking to Toyota, which dominates that system, and I spent a lot of time talking to the folks at Riken, uh, who are this, uh, the, uh, the producer. And so Riken kept telling me, well, yes, they tell us that we have to spread around our machines. And it's easy to spread around the machines. These, these machines that you make a piston ring with are about this big. You could put them all under one roof, or you could put them under 10 roofs, or 100 roofs. It's just a matter of cost. So they said, they keep telling us that we have to move them around. But they keep cutting our <laughs> profits. So uh, that, you know, they're giving us two very different uh, um, uh, 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 messages here. So, you know, so Toyota, uh, even now, Toyota's saying we're going to uh, dual source, triple source everything. We're going to remake the whole system. But I can tell you that that is actually not happening in Japan. Uh, so, um, uh, in fact, you're actually seeing more concentration in certain areas, um, such as uh, the chips that go into cars. Um, and actually, the, and one of the things that, that this is really a complicated issue, um, but it's really quite simple if you look at it, is that it's, it's the issue of competitive risk. If I am uh, at the, the top tier companies, the OEMs that are buying these supplies, they look at each other and it's like, what is the, 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 the horizon of risk? If I make a bad decision uh, today, a year from now, I'm out the door. I personally, the CEO of, of, of Unilever, I'm out the door if I make a bad decision. So if I invest per, you know, in my company, making my company more resilient, well, if there's no event in between now and a year from now, I don't win. In fact, I've just added a cost with no benefit. Yeah. So unless the state comes in and basically makes this even and sort of sets a set of rules, uh, you're not going to have any of these companies making the proper decisions on their own. They cannot do it. Right. That, that was my question for you. Is are, are financial markets and investors prepared to sort of have the patience that would be required for resilient strategies to pay off? No, I, I believe they are. Um, but it depends very much on the credibility that the management team has with their investors. And that's, uh, there's a broad spectrum on that. Uh, managers who have a lot of credibility with their investors can carry the day in making decisions that are right for the long term and are right for uh, on a decisions on a risk-adjusted basis rather than just a near-term basis. Managers who don't have that credibility end up falling into the traps that, that, that Barry's describing. Um, I think corporations are not particularly good at making risk-adjusted decisions because of the way their incentives are organized, investor response just being one of those. Uh, they make good expected value decisions, you know, um, and things like purchasing departments are notoriously held accountable for 2% year-on-year reductions in cost on an expected value basis. If they were making a risk-adjusted decision, they would recognize that over the next 10 years, this 2% that I gained by making my supply chain more brittle would come back and cost me 20% in year seven, and if I factor that probability in, then I wouldn't do it, right? But they're not incentivized that way. The, um, the second thing I'd say that organizations have had a hard time with is this great moderation I was talking about matured um, a generation of executives who were used to making decisions with relatively benign um, uncertainty environments. And they're, re they're having to relearn how to make decisions under uncertainty. Well, that, that actually, I, I'm glad you used that word because uh, another question that, that occurred to me is, you know, we, we draw a distinction, or, or people sometimes do, between, between quantifiable risks and unquantifiable uncertainties. Um, and, and to an extent, I mean, I wonder which is it that we're, that we're talking about here? I mean, it's, it's one thing to ask companies to manage, you know, known risks, but, but it's another to deal with the, 
well, the, the existence of uncertainty in the world, mm -hmm. that there are things that are sort of outside of a, of a corporate planning horizon, it seems to me. It's true. <laughs> uh, and then you enter into the realm of managerial judgment, right. um, which is what makes uh, organization structure and culture so important. Because no one, no existing management team, nor individual on the existing management team, um, by definition, knows what's coming down the pike. And so it's, it's about initial response and then organizational uh, humility and, and culture to, to say, well, our first response isn't necessarily the right one. How do we learn from that? So learning organizations more effective than, than hierarchical organizations. You know, I, um, you know, I actually think that the way the system's set up right now, it's, it's extremely unfair for the well-meaning corporate executive. I mean, I spent, the re uh, in my early days of figuring out what was going on here, uh, I was guided in what I was doing by executive CEOs and uh, large companies, in fact, uh, who understood that the system was incorrectly engineered. Uh, and, um, you know, they were very honest about it. They were, you know, gone into Washington, knocked on doors. What we see here is a failure of leadership in Washington. What we see here is a failure of leadership, uh, uh, you know, of the willingness to actually open the door and, uh, and, and hear news that is not uh, uh, pleasant and to face up to the fact that some of the uh, systems that we uh, uh, run, like the uh, trade system, that you know that you might some of the decisions that we made 15 years ago were wrong. So um, you know, it's I think you know it's, it's this is uh, at no point is this a, a situation in which uh, the corporate executives are the villain um, to the extent that there is a you know people are making bad decisions. It's not at that level. So can, can you tell us, I, I think you, you got cut off for, for time reasons, but you had a slide which had uh, headshots of some, some famous politicians. Uh, what, 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 was, what were they about? Uh, that was a, a number of politicians who were essentially small R Republicans. They were people, you know, these are, if you go back to the beginning of the United States, you know, the, the, the Tea Party, the actual Tea Party, what was the Tea Party? The Tea Party was not really about taxation. If you go back and look at what happened, the Tea Party was a rebellion against monopolization of commerce in this country by the British East India Company. So we were born out of a rebellion against monopoly, uh, and that rebellion has been uh, uh, fought many, many times since then. So those, were, uh, those people up there were, uh, were some of the leaders who had, have stood up against concentrated power. You know, first one on that list was Madison, or that, uh, but and the last one was uh, uh, Eisenhower, who, as you remember in his farewell address, talked about the dangers of the, uh, uh, the military industrial state. So um, the, if, this is a case in which what we saw, one way, the way I look at what happened in the world is essentially 1981, there was a form of coup within the political economic regime that we use to govern this country, govern uh, political activity, uh, uh, economic activity in this country. And a system that had been designed to distribute power was overturned in favor of a system that celebrates efficiency foremost and therefore uh, not only uh, turns a blind eye to monopolization and concentration, but actually celebrates it. So, um, what we have now is, um, you know, so those are the, the, if we go back to what we did well for 200 years, I think we'll uh, go a long ways to fixing this problem. So, I mean, I think it's indisputable that we are seeing more concentration in, in some respects, more, more winner-take-all markets. But at the same time, you, you showed a slide uh, illustrating more, more instability. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I wonder what, I mean, what, what do you think about, about this, uh, this idea that there's a, a monopolization? Well, I think that there's always a tendency toward monopolization. What we're talking about is, is how you safeguard against it, right? And the tendency is economic. The, the tendency is that it concentrates rent in the system to the person who achieves the monopoly power. And, and so there's, there's always that motivation. Uh, and many markets function um, well because it's virtually impossible in competition to achieve that. Mm -hmm. Others, it's much easier to capture. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and where it's easier to capture, that's the role of, of antitrust. Right? Um, I think that, that you're right, the chart I showed is that the guys on the top get toppled at an increasingly uh, fast rate. I think that's, that's a result of some of the forces I was describing that make it um, more important to adapt and be flexible. And large corporations are not inherently about adapt uh, adaptability and flexibility. They're about driving 
uh, a winning model, mm -hmm. right, home and around the world and across products. And those organizations are, are not really that flexible. And I think what, what, we're, what I showed was that when they're not, they lose. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, is there a, a, a winning model for, for companies that are trying to preserve flexibility in the face of that kind of disruptive change? I mean, is the, is the moral of that uh, P&G Unilever comparison that, that they had the right kind of corporate structure? Or is it that um, faced with disruption, random factors prove to be beneficial in, in ways that you can't predict? Uh, so I'd come back to sort of I was harping on. Um, Insightful strategic leadership. This mm -hmm. is why some CEOs are worth every penny they get paid, because right? um, Laffley was. Uh, some, I don't know whether it was luck or skill on the organization structure. Mm -hmm. the, the, they happened to exist at that time with an organization structure that was better able to adapt to the things that hit them. Um, it was a costly organization structure to maintain. Who knows whether it was a good cost benefit before mm -hmm. the events happened. It was certainly a good cost benefit, uh, benefit after. And I do believe in, in, uh, in culture. Uh, an organization's willingness to see, talk about, and do something about risk without becoming parochial or defensive is a really big deal. You know, I, um, I mean, I, I'd agree uh, up to a, to a large degree. The, what we, corporate executives can make their, uh, um, their companies much more resilient uh, up to a certain point. At which point they, you're, you're dealing with a system that is not resilient, in which case everyone goes down. And there's a famous case that sort of proves this. It goes, there, was a, uh, it was, uh, um, uh, there was a fire back in 2000 in a semiconductor plant in New Mexico that was run by Philips. Uh, there was a radio frequency chip that that uh, uh, plant was making that was, had been promised to two companies. One of those companies was called Nokia, the other was called Ericsson. The, um, when that fire happened, this was the only source for, uh, of production for this radio frequency chip. chip. Um, when that fire happened, Nokia had a plan and Nokia moved fast. Ericsson didn't have a plan, Ericsson kind of sat around waiting for uh, Philips to uh, fix the problem. Uh, Nokia ended up with a little glitch in production. They got the little bit of space that was available at a different plant that was run by Philips. Uh, uh, Ericsson ended up with a $500 million plus uh, uh, shortfall that year. Uh, they ended up the next year selling out their production to um, uh, Sony. Um, so it's like if you, uh, it, it, companies, uh, executives absolutely can plan for shocks, uh, but there are certain shocks, large geographic shocks, um, political shocks that no one at this point can plan for. You know, I, I wanted to ask also about, about your presentation. How much of this really has to do with political decisions that are being undertaken in, in foreign countries? That a lot of uh, Asian, you know, mercantilist development strategies seem to lead to, to product specialization and intense clusters uh, in a way that's perhaps out of our hands. And, no, and that's actually one of the things I was going to say is there's a, another limit out there. There's, a, there's a, re, a resistance. Anyone who wants to make their system more geographically resilient, like if you're sourcing all of some component and it's all coming out of South China, and you would actually like to move half of that into, say, Taiwan, um, you may run up against a state power that does not want you to do that which is, the, you know, in Beijing. Now, so, uh, but it's, it, uh, China is not the only mercantilist actor out there. What we've seen is sort of since, and here, uh, uh, since over the last 15 years, you've seen uh, uh, all of these countries, uh, the major uh, 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 industrial com countries of, of Asia, go out and grab hold of certain components. The, the, the Japanese are very good at this. The, uh, uh, the Koreans are very good at this. The Taiwanese are very good at this. And once you have it, you do not let it go unless another state is telling you to, to, to do so. Huh. So, <laughs> but I mean, so this, I mean, it, it seems to me, it's a, it's a tension in, in, in what, what you've been saying that, I mean, part of the, the rationale for the, the sort of global trade paradigm that we're moving to is precisely that those kind of measures are destructive, but that no one country wants to give them up, and that if you have a multilateral framework towards sort of dismantling these sorts of things, that in fact that 
would be how you would get to a, to a more resilient dynamic, as opposed to the United States uh, just sort of getting in on the game and, and grabbing our own particular corner of the supply chain. Oh, yeah, yeah no, it's very important. What I advocate, and I never advocate uh, a, a vision of protectionism. In fact, if we go out and say, oh, we have to have this, this component produced at home, this produ uh, component produced at home, uh, that's not going to work. Uh, and um, w the model I actually look at is, is ways you have to, there's the ideal vision, which is that we're going to turn it all over to the marketplace and uh, the, basically the corporate uh, uh, executives are going to distribute things in, in, a, in, a, in a relatively uh, efficient and safe way. That runs into problems with the mercantilists. Um, what is missing in the system right now is the U.S. state standing up and saying we're not going to be as a nation 100% dependent on China for vitamin C, for instance. We're not going to be 90% uh, dependent on China for the chemicals that go on our drugs. Uh, so it's like, so the, the, the failure in Washington to say that, to use power to force the distribution of the, these activities and when I say distribution, it doesn't mean that any of it comes home. If, in the case of vitamin C, you spread that out so that a quarter of the production is in Thailand, a quarter of the production is in, 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 in Brazil, a quarter of the production is in Europe, and a quarter remains in, in China, that's a pretty safe system. None of that is in the United States. Uh, but you do need sanctions. You do need the, uh, the force of a nation state standing up and saying, we will not have that stand for this kind of concentration of power over us. Yeah. International political trust busting. Yeah. yeah. So, so this idea of a, a great moderation has obviously proven to be, you know, rather illusory. Uh, but, but how do you know, as an organizational leader, if you are experiencing resilient structures, or if you're just experiencing a kind of, you know, false dawn of, of risklessness? I mean, how how could you tell? <laughs> Yeah, it, it's hard to know, right? Because I could tell you that the people who grew up in that environment didn't think they were in anything unusual, and it was 25 years long, and, and that was, for many executives, it was their entire experience. Um, we've, we've taken to, at, at our firm, to, um, to articulating a, a notion of performance, or a notion of, of corporate um, activity and measurement of that activity with this lens of what we call performance and health. And performance is, how are you doing right now? And health is, how robust um, are you set up to do well in the future? And, and we and others have started to try to delineate um, how do you measure current health, which is really how do you predict a measurement of, of future performance um, under, under a range of uncertainty. And it, it's got a whole bunch of dimensions around it that are, that are strategic, organizational, product, technology, right? Every aspect of the business system you can think about as having current performance and future health. And I think just explicitly calling that out and not just focusing on the here and now and saying, okay, but what about health? How are we going to do next year? Then you start looking at talent pipelines. How are we doing on campus with recruiting? Mm -hmm. You just kind of go back in your system. You know what predicts the future and you pay attention on the precursors. And uh, I think with that, uh, we're, we're about out of time. Uh, so thank you both for your presentations, for Thanks, interesting man. remarks.